Okay, it is officially 11.05. We're going to go ahead and get this show on the road. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today to uh, join us uh, here at the City Archives and Special Collections at NOLA Library to um, hear from Monique Verdan uh, for Indigenous Histories today. Uh, I want to give a quick introduction to Monique, just a moment, and um, after that, I will turn it over to you, Monique, and we can get started. But today, uh, um, United Home and Nation, citizen Monique Verdan will explore the Deepwater Horizon disaster and the ongoing effects of the people on the people of coastal South Louisiana from the early 20th century to modern times. Um, we'll be discussing all that today. And Monique, I would like to introduce, is an interdisciplinary storyteller who documents the complex relationship between environment, culture, and climate in Southeast Louisiana. She is a citizen of the Homa Nation, director of the Land Memory Bank and Seed Exchange, and a member of Another Gulf is Possible Collaborative, working to envision just economies, vibrant communities, and sustainable ecologies. Monique is supporting the Oklahina Ihishola people of the Sacred Medicine Trail, a network of indigenous gardeners, as well as the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network Gulf South Food and Medicine Sovereignty Program Manager. She is co-producer of the documentary, My Louisiana Love, which will be returning to screens on PBS on April 14th. Um, and her work has been included in a variety of environmentally inspired projects, including the multi-platform performance Cry You One and the collaborative book Return to Yakni Chudu, Home of Migrations, which incidentally is available for checkout from the public library now. Um, here it is, if y'all can see it. It's also in our catalog and we have links on our Facebook. But, um, so, uh, that's an introduction to Monique and the program today. Let me do a little housekeeping before I let us begin. Um, so I am Amanda Fallis. I'm an archivist here at the City Archives at New Orleans Public Library. And we're grateful to Monique um, to be presenting with us today. She also has um, a uh, photo installation exhibit at the main library at 219 Loyola Avenue that's complementary to both this program, all of her work, and uh, return to Yakni Chitto. Um, so if you guys can make it down to the main library, we definitely recommend seeing that. Uh, in terms of how we're going to run the program today, feel free to type what you want in chat, but what we're going to do is I'm going to let Monique speak and present to us so we can all learn together. And then at the end of her, um, her uh, talk, we're going to open it up to questions, either via chat or you, I'll allow y'all to start unmuting yourselves and you can ask directly. I'll kind of administer the order of the questions, if that's okay. And um, I'll kind of or organize that and we'll do that at the end. If you do have questions that appear during her talk, please feel free to uh, chat. I will record them and ask them for you at the end or are calling you to um, uh, ask them yourself at the end. But with that all being said, I would like to turn it over to Monique. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, and thanks to the public library for being um, such an important resource for our community and um, for welcoming uh, Return to Yakni Shido onto the into the stacks and um, in the exhibit uh, right there downtown. Um, I am really grateful and honored that all of you have joined today. It's such a beautiful day outside. Um, so I, um, yeah, I'm just super happy that we're all here together right now um, and going to share a little bit. I, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I always feel like I'm a little bit out of control. So <laughs> you guys let me know. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, having a conversation with all of you. Yeah, so there is um, a practice of um, land acknowledgements that has been growing and um, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that um, that, that is a, a practice. Um, and I recently was with some folks and um, someone said they didn't have a land acknowledgement practice, but that they were always 
acknowledging um, the the relative, friend, spirit that's closest to them, um, whose land we were on, and um, they, I thought that was really sweet, and so I just wanted to, you know, first acknowledge all of your ancestors and all of my ancestors who've made it possible for us to be here, and also to recognize this, um, uh, this sweet soul that has been a guide and a real force in my life and a teacher um, who just recently passed in November, Anise Verdin. And um, sorry, I'm getting emotional. I'm also having a bit of an allergy um, episode. So um, my sinuses have been out of control too, but um, he just recently passed in November. And um, yeah, I just wanna acknowledge him and give gratitude for him because so much of the work that I've created would not be possible without him and so many others who are in this um, uh, maybe too long <laughs> slideshow that I'm going to share today. So, um, so yes, uh, to all of our ancestors and those who have been teachers and guides in our lives. Um, some of these maps that you'll see have been created by a dear friend of mine, Jacob Rosenzweig, who's been a collaborator over the years and um, in some projects that we've made and helped to create illustrations. And he always reminds me that, you know, maps are the colonizer's tool <laughs> and also maps are imperfect. Um, so, but they are a great reference and I do love them. Um, and so you'll see a lot of maps throughout this presentation. But just kind of orienting of like where we are and where the journey will take us today. Um, I'm here in Bulbuncha, so-called uh, New Orleans, um, where the big bend in the river happens um, over near the big toe of the boot-shaped state. And um, of course, the Bayou Lafouche coming down um, in the middle of the Delta and the Atchafalaya to the west. And so the Yaknishido is the big country found between the Atchafalaya and Mississippi, which are the same river. And um, in the practice of giving gratitude and thanks to, um, you know, acknowledging the land and acknowledging all the stewards and ancestors of this place, I also think it's really important for us to acknowledge the Mississippi. Um, and the river has always been a life force um, for all of us here in the Delta and connecting the water sheds to the north to the ocean basins um, and yeah just um, gratitude for the Mississippi because if it wasn't for for that life force we would have no land upon which to acknowledge here and um, you know being in in Bulbuncha a place of many languages or place of many tongues as the Choctaw called it I think it's um, you know where we are uh, and on the planet i think of it as a powerpoint and a place where many different peoples um, where many different migrations where many um regenerative practices are happening here whether that means the shrimp coming in right now um preparing for that may season or the migration of the tropical songbirds that are coming through um and yeah, that this sacred site was a place of trade and a place where people were coming together to exchange ideas and goods and, and that all these years later, um, Bulbuncha is still living up to its name. Um, and especially in thinking that just in 2019, this part of the city or this city, part of the Delta, um, welcomed close to 19 million visitors. So um, Bulbuncha um, is still a place, uh, and New Orleans is um, uh, been really good at rebranding <laughs> the name of a place. Uh, I start a lot of my presentations with this image, um, and for me, it really has been um, my gateway and kind of understanding where I come from and who I am and where a place my grandmother called La Pointe or Pono Chien is and what it was. Um, my two great grandmothers stand on the front line here, and this is in front of my grandmother Celestine's house. Um, Celestine is wearing the white with the child's uh, hand on her shoulder, and then my grandmother Ernestine is standing at the other end of the line holding a baby. And this image was taken in the 1920s and was part of um, five of these photographs that my grandmother had, which were 
um, these antique postcards and she, you know, she kept them stored away in her armoire. Um, but, uh, every summer I remember her pulling them out and us looking through the shoebox of photographs and her telling me stories about her childhood and, um, becoming a woman here, um, where the Gulf waters start to meet the sweetwater estuaries. Um, and in her childhood, um, it was not a place that is, it is today. It's very different now. Um, I, you know, her stories to me were that places where she picked pecans as a child in this <clears throat> flotant, right? You know, it's, it's funny, this place in between where we call home that it is like part land and part water and part always kind of changing. Um, and yeah, where she picked pecans, my, my cousins are now, um, putting their crab traps out. So a lot has changed in a relatively short amount of time. My grandmother passed in 2016, um, and lived to be 101. So what she saw in her lifetime was a dramatic change. And I think of this time in the late 1920s when this image was taken and what was happening in South Louisiana. This is the time <clears throat> when the oil and gas folks were coming in. <coughs> excuse me and um you know essentially um either tricking or just stealing uh land rights away from my ancestors by getting them to um to sign x's on paperwork that they could not read or or um you know they didn't even speak english at that time my father's generation was the first generation to go to public school and learn English. So um, this really was a moment, a moment in time where many things changed. And I think um, if my ancestors were able to stand in the, you know, stand in the way of the, of the, of the rigs coming in and of the canals being dredged, how different South Louisiana might look today. Um, the Homa, uh, the Choctaw, the Shiramacha, the Takapa Ishak, the Akola Pisa, the Washa, the Shawasha, the Shapatulis, the Bayou Gula, the Biloxi, and many names of nations that I'm not saying, um, and all the names of the nations that were never recorded in those colonial journals that were the histories um, that were documented. Um, because they were erased due to genocide and um, illness brought by European um, Europeans who came into the territory. Um, and this is, you know, um, a really dynamic and diverse place um, biologically and culturally. And I think of that um, <clears throat> in a past, present, future sense, definitely. When I'm sharing this image of the crawfish, uh, um, it's crawfish season, but um, also I've been quite fascinated with these little creatures. The crawfish is um, the so-called war emblem, but a, a, a creature that um, is highly revered by the Homa um, and also um, other southeastern nations um, point to the crawfish as the creator, um, as the creature that went to the bottom when all was covered in water and started to build the land. And I think they're really fascinating in that they live in between, right? <clears throat> they're living in between the land and the water. They're above and they're below. And I also think it's really interesting. This is a new fun fact that I just learned, which is that the females are the ones who build um, their chimneys and each chimney is built uh, by a single crawfish, uh, female crawfish. Um, what happens in the courting process? I'm not really sure. I haven't gotten into all of that, but I do think that um, these creations, and now that you know that, I just encourage you to take a deep look at the um, differences of crawfish um, chimneys or crawfish holes um, and to see and to appreciate that architecture. Um, but the Homa are from a mound, Mississippian mound building tradition, which 
there's a lot of questions in mythology and cosmology um, and questions. Were they ceremonial? Were they burial mounds? Were they trash heaps? Um, <clears throat> and that can be debated. Uh, and this image here that you're looking at um, is something that I've been doing lately in layering, um, layering United States Geological Survey maps on top of um, uh, of each other. <laughs> so over time, um, one of the base map here is from the 1930s and the top map is from um, the 2000s. And of course, you know, the deeper the water or when you're seeing the blue that's become water, which was more of a trembling prairie in the 1930s. <clears throat> and, and, and then of course the photograph is uh, one that I took that is of the territory. So in the right hand or in the right side of the image, you can see there's a little bit of white. Um, and in the 1930 map, this is marked as an Indian mound. And in the 2005 map, 2010 map, I'm not 100% sure right now, but um, it's just simply marked as a cemetery. But this is a mound that's over 1500 years old, where Tula Bay, it's said that Tula Bay Kuto, who was a Biloxi metal chief, um, and that whole metal um, authority of Europeans given these kind of tokens, whether they be metals or whether they be um, sometimes bells or trinkets. Um, these trading bells were found all the way up in, um, you know, very far north near Canada, even following these from the coast that, you know, Spanish and French people would give these little bells, which is kind of a weird phenomenon. Um, but anyways, I'm digressing The Biloxi uh, metal chief Tula Bay is said to be buried here on top of this mound. Um, and yeah, I just think it's really fascinating. 1500 years, um, uh, 1500 year old mound is very different than just a cemetery. And as the land is changing so quickly here, what is happening is that these mounds have become these hot spots of biodiversity, which you can still have, you know, you can still find some of the old medicine plants that are growing here. And if, you know, the oak trees are still somewhat alive because of that elevation. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see, <clears throat> of course, um, this territory is crisscrossed with canals. Um, the Homa Navigation Canal is this deep water shape, straight line kind of coming up the on the left-hand side of the map, um, just right of Felix Lake. But um, this kind of uh, infrastructure and the legacy <laughs> That industry has left behind and is still taking advantage of in certain ways but also of course onshore offshore has changed a lot um and i mean a lot has changed in a hundred plus years but um you know as the technology changes as the exploration changes where they're going um <clears throat> but uh the damage is done this is just a map uh, just to share with you where there are other mound sites in the delta um, and so many of these are coastal and um, the archaeologists are saying that we're losing up to two sites a year um, because of land loss and sea level rise. Um, I'm just going to kind of flip through these images and I'll point you um, <clears throat> to a site. It's Southern Cultures, um, uh, you know, gave me this opportunity to create the series of collage maps. And, and again, this goes back to like me layering time and artifact and history and diving into archives in different ways and then layering them on top of each other to, to see a place in a different way. And this is Itihoma, um, uh, the bastardization of the, of the uh, Itihoma meaning, uh, big stick, uh, of course, rebranded Baton Rouge, um, and Estruma is thought to be uh, kind of a mistranslation, but, um, you know, I'm always learning, <laughs> always learning things. So even from month to month, you know, this kind of understanding of place and language and history <clears throat> is constantly challenging me to relook at things. And um, just at the bottom part of this image, you see, again, I've, I've circled Indian Mound. Um, in red, and that's at the LSU, um, like right outside of uh, Tiger Stadium. Uh, what do they call it? Death Valley. <laughs> um, there are these two ancient mounds. It's 
not debated. They're at least 6,000 years old, but there is a geologist who is now um, deep in research trying to even prove that they're much older, possibly even 11,000 or older, which would make them <clears throat> some of the oldest structures that are man-made in the world. Um, and, you know, kids like roll down them. And I just, I share this just in the, that I'm constantly trying to challenge myself to rec try to see what isn't completely visible, but is right in front of our face. And I think that, you know, one of these ways for me has just been words um, of places that were people, places where people and, and still are a people or a river. Um, Pensacola, Mobile, Biloxi, Pascagoula, um, Bayou Gula. I mean, these are just a few. There's many, and they're all over the country too. So, um, you know, it's like right in right in your face, but we never question. Oh, I, I didn't, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I'm a grown woman, and then recognizing and putting these pieces together. So, I was just share that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I, uh, doing this journey with the maps, uh, taught me a lot about, um, you know, indigenous histories that I didn't know of. And specifically here at, um, uh, Manshack Point, where there was an, another huge mound complex, of course, now Dow Chemical, um, that's the, the map that's kind of layered in the, in the, um, on the left-hand side, Oper uh, operates here at Plaquemine Point, which for those of you who don't know, there are a couple of islands that are in the Mississippi River between Baton Rouge or Itihoma and Belbuncha. And beautiful, actually quite beautiful. I got to spend the night on Plaquemine Island across from the disgusting Dow Chemical plant. Um, but there is something um, sacred and timeless about the river and the wilds that um, are on the banks and, and on the island here. And so for those of you who are interested, this is the article and it's uh, totally available and free online. You can read more about the sites. <coughs> I'm so sorry that I'm <coughs> feeling not 100% right now. Um, and it also marked where the water intakes are in um, along the journey too, which is always kind of horrifying. So this image here, um, you see this arrow that's on the Mississippi, it says water intake, that's at the Bayou Lafouche, which um, of course has been cut off from the Mississippi, but they're still pumping water down the Bayou Lafouche to uh, provide fresh water to the estuaries and of course to all the people who live south of there. And this, um, as you saw in the mound map, you know, this along, and of course, along the Mississippi, there are so many mounds um, that still exist, um, and also so many that have been totally, um, you know, bulldozed material taken to build roads or um, just gotten rid of because it was in the way of growing sugar um, <clears throat> in most cases. And so this is St. James Parish. Um, which I also recently in some of my research realized that on my mom's side, so my, my dad's side are, are my homo, homo folks, my mom's, you know, classic um, New Orleans, old school, first colonizers into the territory kind of ancestry. And uh, Jacques Cantrell, the reason why St. James Parish is called St. James is because of Jacques Cantrell, who's this ancestral grandfather of mine that I'm learning. And... Um, he had a plantation in Cabanosi, which is right here in this territory where the um, this map is, and uh, also his family were the commandants of the time during the Spanish um, occupation, and had a very close relationship with the Homa, who were all living along the banks here at that time. Um, in the colonial journals, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm <clears throat> losing my voice. Um, in the colonial journals, the, the Homa are first documented north of Itihoma, the red stick, which marked the uh, hunting grounds between the Bayou Gula to the south and the Homa were, um, were more to the north. And um, they were, it was described as, you know, this good earth, high ground, um, lots of, lots of agriculture, a healthy community. 
um, hundreds of people living there. And that site, um, modern day, is known as Angola, where the farm, um, one of the world's, if not the world's largest penitentiary is. Um, so I think of, again, these like layers um, that are seen and unseen and recognized and, and not. Um, and this site is also part of, connected to, I guess we could say, the Strategic Oil Reserve. Um, so sorry, I'm just gonna try to keep my coughing down. Um, but, you know, I mean, we pass by these roads, maybe we don't even go down the river road on either side of the river. Um, I think that a lot of people um, kind of, it's easy to forget that the river is even there sometimes um, uh, because we're so disconnected from it in so many ways. Um, some of you may have been to a place called Homa's House, um, a big plantation. And there's a lot of history there. Um, but speaking of mounds, there was a huge mound there. And if you do ever go to that plantation, there are these 500 year old oak trees that surround the property. And um, the mound was in the center of, um, and the trees were all planted um, strategically surrounding that mound. Of course, at some point in time, the mound was just kind of flattened so that a railway could go through. Um, that railway is not going through anymore because cane is not being grown there anymore. But um, it's a very um, popular tourist site. Um, and also the, the history of the Homa there um, is quite complicated and I think, you know, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot I could say there. I, I kind of won't go down that wormhole today, but, um, supposedly in the 1700s, a Homa leader sold this site for $175 to these two guys. And it's been contested, uh, essentially ever since. Um, and this is at a time where, um, in the 1700s, during this kind of disruption post, um, colonizers coming into the territory where the Homa start to really, um, make their migration to the South and away from the Mississippi following the Bayou Lafourche, and of course the Bayou Terrebonne, which, um, that's why the Fouche, the fork, um, Terrebonne and... Um, Lafouche cut from each other, which you can see here in this map at um, Thibodeau. So Lafouche de la Chidamacha is what the French called it, the fork of the Chidamacha. Um, and uh, if you go down, the fork is actually here where the Bayou Lafouche and the Bayou Terrebonne split. And this really becomes, you know, this territory that you're looking at from that time of the late 1700s to the Louisiana Purchase happening in 1803, um, this becomes the place of refuge um, and retreat, really. And um, the, you know, the Homa getting pushed further and further down the bayous until they get all the way to the ends in places like Point O'Shan, um, uh, Dulac, uh, Montague, Golden Meadow, um, and, uh, and, and even places further south, uh, Fala, La Skin, or other communities. Um, islands that were in the estuaries here where um, ancestors lived. So Standard Oil. Standard Oil, um, 1909, they, uh, they built what at that time was considered the largest refinery in the world at Itihoma. Um, and they were already kind of dabbling in different ways um, here in the Delta. So uh, their standard oil is the uh, the grandfather, you might say, of Exxon Mobil. Um, and really, you know, this, the Rockefellers, um, there's a lot that we could talk about there in regards to like how wealth is made and how philanthropy um, continues even to this day um, from these kinds of, you know, dirty deals in a sense where South Louisiana really got um, sold for, for, and we are still um, surviving the consequences of these decisions and how um, 
yeah, how how the game has been played, so they say, and especially how our politicians um, have played the game and not played it so well. Uh, <clears throat> but when Standard Oil is first coming in to Louisiana is around the time when my grandmother, um, you know, shortly after they came in, my grandmother was born. And this image is... Um, was taken in the late 1990s when she first brought me all the way down. We have to get in, I had to get in a boat to get to the place where she grew up. And <clears throat> this place, La Pointe, um, Pointe aux Chien, is um, right in the Barataria Terrebonne estuary in the heart of the Yaknishido, of course. Here again is one of these maps of place. Point Ocean or Point Ocean. It is debated. Is it, is it Point of the Oaks or Point of the Dog? Um, but the truth is, like so many bayous, there's a chenier, an oak ridge that follows the bayous all the way down. And, um, you know, not that long ago, these trees were alive. And of course, these kinds of ghost forests that you can find all across South Louisiana are really evidence of the legacy that oil and gas um, has left. And so, um, you know, the, oh, these oak trees are falling into open water, or uh, in some cases, and disappearing even from this time when I when I took these photographs not that long ago of the trees um, in this. And then, I, you know, I create, this is again one of these maps that's created with a, a 1930s map um, as the base, and then a 2010 map on on top. And I encourage folks to go to the USGS to look at maps. Um, it's really kind of fascinating to see how the technology changes, but now we have all of this satellite imagery, and this is public data, so it's really easy to find. USGS topo maps, really great. Um, I won't stay here too long on this map, life in the red zone, and I do want to have conversation with all of you, so I might kind of um, put it into fast gear and keep going, but... These are the projections of land loss. Um, I mean, a lot of this red has already been lost. Um, and of course, uh, the Yakni Shido endured a direct hit um, this hurricane season with Hurricane Ida. Um, but of all across the coast, all you know, uh, of all across the Gulf Coast has been really um, pummeled, and we know that. Um, last season when Hurricane Ida hit, that was not the first storm and it surely won't be the last. And for years I've watched as people have gotten mitigation grants to raise their houses up 20 feet, 17 feet in the sky. And so many people came home to their, to, didn't come home to anything except their houses blown to bits and just the piers left behind. So how we, <coughs> excuse me, remain and reclaim and how we adapt, um, because the state of Louisiana really is, you know, was pushing lift your house um, or leave. And I think more and more folks are, are contemplating what leaving might look like. Um, and I've even seen the slow trickle of the great migration happening. Um, but I do think that um, our coastal territories and our coastal homelands are important. Um, and you can't run from climate change. Like you can maybe get out of the way of a storm surge, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to feel the other effects um, <clears throat> wherever you might go, wherever you might be, anywhere in the world. Um, this here is another dear friend of mine and um, auntie, elder, uh, collaborator, Vivian Hotard. She recently passed as well. Um, and uh, this is in Pont Barre. So Pont Barre was where Humble Oil uh, first came into Terrebonne Parish um, and when coastal drilling started to happen in that 1920s time. And Vivian would tell me stories about the, you know, them bringing the, the, the wells in and the, you know, having these blowouts and, uh, you know, oil being on everything or um, huge flares <laughs> that lasted for days and how terrifying it was. And, um, and really how the community of Pompare got run out of, um, of that territory. And so, oh, 
Oh, that's <laughs> that's funny. I don't know how this one got here, but this is a project called the Float Lab that we're working on. Speaking of remaining and reclaiming and adapting, and maybe we can talk about that in the after talk. But um, this is where I wanted to go, which is uh, here's one of these 1930 maps. Um, uh, this a marsh buggy, this kind of invention really was revolutionary for being able to 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 get out into the um, into the marshes and into the trembling prairie, which was invented in like the 1930s. And then here's you know from the 2010 map in the way that the USGS is now um, marking things. And as you see, not a lot of not a lot of land. Um, of course, not all of that is totally submerged, but <clears throat> not enough to really define. Um, I'll just leave this here. I was just in thinking about our conversation today. I'm like, okay, what's the most recent, right? It's always changing. Are there 2,000 rigs out in the Gulf now that are operating or, you know, what is, you know, so here's just a snapshot of something. And this is from um, EIA.gov. So um, this is the, um, the acronym. I'm spacing on right now, but I, I encourage, again, another resource for folks to go to, to just kind of dig into the data more. But right here, it says <clears throat> the state of Louisiana accounted for 9% of U.S. total marketed gas production in 2020 and has about 8% of the nation's gas reserves. Louisiana's 17 oil refineries account for nearly one-fifth of the nation's refining capacity and can process about 3.4 million barrels of crude per day. In 2020, Louisiana's two liquefied natural gas export terminals shipped out about 55% of the U.S. total LNG exports. So, you know, and there's more data there. So I just encourage you all to go there and also to complicate the narrative, to remember that Louisiana is so often at the bottom of the list when it comes to quality of, uh, you know, health care, education, um, top of the list when it comes to poverty, uh, oil and gas investments have not uh, brought all the, the, the land of milk and honey that they promised. And we're dealing with places like Ile de Jean Charles, which is also in the Yagni Shido and really just, you know, right across the way from pont where my grandmother grew up um, and has lost 90 to 95 percent of its landmass since the 1930s. And so now folks are being forced with these questions and you all, some of you have, may have heard about this um you know 48 million dollar grant that came through for the first ever climate relocation a few years back and um the state of louisiana uh, was kind of in charge and it's been kind of a mess and um there's still lots of questions and it's not the only community that's facing um you know do you stay or do you go and of course there is this fear that the state wants to move the poor people off so that the rich people can come in and put up their fancy camps which is what is happening um at the ends of the roads and i've been saying gentrification is really weird in the times of climate change because the places that are most vulnerable are also becoming the places that are most desirable but you take a home a person away from their bayou side you're taking them away from their ability to feed themselves and their family their place of business their place of celebration um and really their kitchen sink here's a probably kind of familiar map of pipelines coming out of the gulf of mexico and onshore to transport porting to places as far as away as the northeast right bringing bringing gas <clears throat> i'm gonna try to catch my breath <laughs> I'm just going to let us look at some of these images. Of course, this is from the BP drilling disaster of 2010, which lasted three months and they couldn't figure out how to make it stop, which is really frightening to watch like the news, the weather, and then where the oil is going every day. And even though that's been ten, uh, 12 years ago now, um, I still think that we're not any safer any, or any further along um, in protecting um, you know, protecting what it is that is so so sacred and important for so many, which is the ocean basin. This nasty photograph uh, is really another kind of entry point for me. It's called Grand Bois. Um, and in the late 90s, I my cousin Clarice Frilou, who has been a huge um, 
uh, anchor for me and um, has inspired me to to do this work that I've been doing all of my adult life, I guess. And because of this disgusting facility where they're treating offshore oil field waste um, and it's less than, you know, <clears throat> now they've created a bit, a bit more of a buffer, but it's, you know, 1,500 feet from the community of Grombois um, and it's disgusting um, and toxic and in a flood zone just, you know, north of some of the fastest disappearing land in the world and just south of the intercoastal waterway, which is, is a federal canal. Um, so it floods every time there's a, a hurricane now and flooding more and more frequently as we're having more storms. And of course, we've had more land loss. This is um, my aunt, my grandma, my grandmother's best friend, my aunt, my great aunt's house. Um, and this was taken in 2004. It's been kind of an iconic image of mine, which I could share every hurricane season and people might think it's happening because, but this is of course, right near the facility. Um, and of course, when it floods there, it flows all over. Nature doesn't create straight lines. Um, we have these uh, lines of defense that uh, crisscross our state, but um, facing more and more challenges. And, you know, there's been over 10,000 miles of canals. Uh, I pointed out the Homa Navigation Canal, which of course is tied in with that intercoastal waterway system. And then here in this top right hand corner, you can see the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, which is here, um, uh, you know, servicing the port of New Orleans. Um, and they've closed it now, but you know, these legacies of these, you know, death by 10,000 cuts, essentially, um, you know, it's irreparable damage is done in a lot of cases. And this is St. Bernard Parish, which is really my grandparents made a migration here um, in the 1940s <clears throat> to get out of the oppression of Terrebonne Lafouche Parish, where if you had a last name of Verdan, Dardar, Hotar, Nakan, or Biyo, they knew you were Indian. Um, and by making a migration here um, to St. Bernard Parish, they were able to kind of navigate the discrimination in a different way. Um, my my father's generation was allowed to go to public schools um, and, uh, and my grandparents were eventually allowed the opportunity to vote. Here's my grandmother after Hurricane Katrina um, in St. Bernard Parish, her house filled up with 11 feet of water like many. Um, and I'll just, you can see all of these photographs in the Return to Yakni Shido book, which you can um, check out from the library. And you can also check out the exhibition um, that was curated by Michelle Verisco. And there's some words by Raymond Moose Jackson, um, Kathy Randalls, and uh, Nick Sly, as well as my elder, Anise Verdant, and Jane Verdant, and um, youth, Allison. Uh, Rodriguez, who's been a dear collaborator of mine um, over the, her entire life at this point. Um, I just want to leave you guys with a, a bit of shining light because um, I feel like, you know, the, the legacy is long. And I said from standard oil to VP drilling disaster, but it's like, no, we have to go back to the col colonial days um, in order to really um, put the pieces together. And, um, and I, I, I say that you know, the more I've learned about all the layers of the ugly and the gross that exist, the more I have also learned about the infinite beauty that is present here in the Delta and feel so grateful for my community and for my family and for my friends and for the plants um, and the creatures and the Mississippi. And i um, super honored to be working with a network of indigenous gardeners for the Oklahoma Ikish Holo Network, the people of the Sacred Medicine Trail. And um, I'm gonna just drop a link in the chat if you guys are interested in staying connected to me. And I think Amanda might send out an email next week too with that content as well. But, um, you know, I'm we're really working to um, support food and medicine sovereignty. So we have a couple of sites that are um, in the Delta, but also recognizing that we need to bring plants and people to safer places sometimes. And so um, you can see on this map, some of our collaborators are in um, Oakla, uh, uh, sorry, um, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, there's the Medicine Wheel Garden um, that's stewarded by Tammy Greer, Dr. Tammy Greer. Um, and then also over in Florala, Alabama, we have a sister who just bought 31 acres and is doing this amazing fruit forest. 
And um, just this past fall, I was able to acquire 12 acres that's out north of Lafayette in a place called Prairie des Femmes, Women's Prairie. Um, and we're starting to figure out how that can be a retreat place for good times and in bad. Um, and so here's just a couple of images of us doing our work together um, and making medicine together and learning together. And just one or two final plugs. Um, My Louisiana Love is rebroadcasting on public television through um, the World Channel, which has a program called America Reframed. And so that'll start on um, next week, next Thursday, um, the 14th, and we'll be airing until May 15th. Um, and it'll also be streamable during that time. So if you're interested, you can just go to the World Channel um dot com and find out more information and then here's our book return to yakni shudo so please check it out at the library and i will stop sharing and hope we can have a conversation thanks so much thank you so much monique that that was incredible it's it's an amazing amount of information um i know i was dropping links left and right in the chat but um as we <coughs> said um He's actually got a full guide that I am going to um, put on our website, the archives website, on um, Monday. And I will email everybody who registered a direct link. Oh, and she's got a link to her Google Drive, too. So you can grab it there as well. But I'll also send a link to everybody who registered for the program today to uh, download it there as well as m on Monday. And of course, we'll also, this is being recorded for the library, so we'll get the video of this up next week as well. But um, I just wanted to open up a chat to everybody. Uh, I believe you should be able to unmute yourselves now if you'd like to um, raise your hand or, or um, chime in. Uh, I'll try to, and you can also uh, type your question in chat if you prefer to do it that way. And we'll try to, I'll try to moderate and keep it in order, but um, let me open up the floor to y'all now. Yes, Robert. Hello, Monique. It's good to see you. I would like to push it back beyond the colonial. Do you have any idea of what the population was like before DeSoto arrived in Louisiana? I've read that there were perhaps many, many more people than we normally think there were. I don't know if you've gone beyond the colonial, though. Yeah, I, you know, I'm always still learning um, and I, I really don't have um, more information than, than that time. Um, I think that it's important that we keep looking and un to un for, un for understanding um, and there definitely was a lot more than what was recorded in colonial journals, um, which is funny that we kind of source them and... Um, also trying to read between the lines always too and what is misunderstandings and um, what is truth and what has been left out as well but yeah I, I if you find anything please let me know because I would love to learn more I will thank you I'm muted. Yes, please, y'all, um, please unmute. Ask ask any questions of us. Um, also, if you prefer to type them in chat, you're welcome to do that as well. But um, I uh, I uh, am thinking. I I feel that your your um, there is a lot of expounding on this. But um, what's a good source that you recommend, Monique, to learn more about? I guess the uh, the coastal impacts starting with Standard Oil. I know 64 Parishes has an article about Standard Oil in Louisiana, but it's just from the perspective of them putting down the tinier oil companies and Huey P. Long standing up for the tiny oil companies back in the day. And that's really the extent of 64 Parishes article on the subject. Do you have a better resource that you could recommend? Well, um, I'm hoping that there will be a better resource that is created in the near future. 
Um, but I do think, uh, you know, I'm very into like just the data opportunities that are out there. So um, there's, uh, again, an open source um, platform called Sunrise. Um, and if you go to that, you can do these kind of chain of titles that will trace, keep tracing back, um, you know, because it's like the companies or they change hands or it keeps going, um, which is really interesting. Also, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of information out there. Uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which was the minerals management service prior to the BP drilling disaster, um, you know, they're required by law to do these social impact studies, um, even though there's not a whole lot of onshore happening, but because of the offshore stuff that's impacting folks. Um, and so there's a anthropologist by the name of Diane Austin, who um, is based at the University of Arizona, but who's been doing a lot of work with their team over the years um, and historical and current. Uh, so, you know, I recommend, um, you know, those, they're kind of boring -y documents. I don't think I've ever found a real, um, and it's probably my bad, I should do better, more research. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that, you know, those kinds of documents are really interesting. But again, I find them a little bit like, academia um and uh again like in that um how do we read between the lines like what are the anthropologists recording that is not important to the people but you know it gets left out and just how history gets recorded in those ways there is a new book that came out um just last year that's more about the homa and i'm gonna um gonna pull it up uh, I've just been reading it again, and I know his work. Um, it's called A Kingdom of Water and um, kind of goes into more of the the politics of the Homa and their migration to modern times. Um, and it's really, I think it's well done. So, yeah, I don't know if the library has that. It just, it just came out, but that's right, What's the title again? A Kingdom of Water. Um, Let me check. I think if not, I'll make sure that uh, it gets on our um, ordering list. A Kingdom of Water. Yeah, I uh, I never um, I never do Kindle, but <laughs> I was recently on the road, so I have have it here. Uh, a Kingdom of Water adaptation and survival in the Homa Nation. I don't see it, but I am going to make sure that gets um, on our selection list. Cool. I've got it, um, yeah, from Nebraska Press. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will make sure that we get copies ordered for the library and I'll see if we can get some circulation ones too. And here's, here's a link to that for those of you who, who want to go straight there. But I, I do understand it is, it is a little pricey, so we will definitely do our best to at least get it ordered for the, for the archives. Um, oh, I just had a question and lost it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, does anybody else have any uh, comment or question? Uh, yes, Robert. It's me again. I appreciated your showing Grand Bois. Dr. Mike Robichaud talked to me about it a lot, and I've never seen the location. He told me about the tankers bringing waste products from the oil fields and dumping them in those pits and the people becoming ill just from breathing the air. Your story reminds me of Cameron Parrish where I'm from. And most of my people are actually leaving the parish. It's the only parish in Louisiana, I think, that has lost population. But we don't have a tribal system. We just are individuals. We're all a tight community. But everybody's gone north to Louisiana. I'm going to tell you a quick story about oil coming there. It came to my grandfather's land in the form of a wooden derrick. I was five years old. 
and I saw it abandoned there. And I was so angry that the oil company abandoned a derrick on my grandfather's land that I took a crap on it and just walked away very satisfied. <laughs> hey. I've, I've heard that the Homa are now working on trying to recreate their native language. I wonder if, if that's gotten any further, Monique. Um, the, there is a project called the Homa Language Project that has been stewarded by Young Homa. It's not um, officially, you know, under the United Homa Nation. I think that they are having some collaboration um, just recently and that, um, you know, the Homa have been speaking uh, Homa French, which is a 17th century colonial French that's mixed with a uh, Muscogee sentence structure and that going back to, you know, what was the what was the trade language um, of the times and, um, you know, now it's English, it was French and before that it was Yama. Um, also known as Mobilian. And so, um, yeah, they're, they're working really hard and have been in conversation with a lot of other language folks um, and in dialogue specifically with some Choctaw relatives up in uh, Mississippi. So that project continues and um, you can learn more about it at the Homa Language Project.org, I think is what they're at. Um, but they're awesome and um, always always growing and learning and um, hopefully getting some young younger folks in um, into the work too of really uh, resurrecting and also revitalizing for contemporary times a homa language oh I'm getting some I'm getting some questions good good um let's see here so Kara Stone Pfeiffer asks can you tell us more about what is happening with the Isle de Jean Charles relocation um I can't really speak to to it too much um I can just kind of let you know what the little bit that I do know which is that um, it's it's been kind of a mess and there are folks who are not wanting to engage with the state anymore. So um, the state has a really terrible acronym for the Office for Community Development, OCD. And OCD is in was in charge of the project. Um, so the HUD money came in and OCD was um, trying to to move it. Uh, there was a lot of meetings and things. Um, there was some kind of controversial, I thought, I was sitting on the council at one point in time for the United Home Nation, um, but kind of controversial land use in that like they had language, which I think they've changed since saying that uh, whoever got the, you know, relocation that they would then be able to um, go to their land to recreate and I was just like we're not really recreators like people need to get on their boats and work and fish but they're not sports fishermen you know and it was just kind of really um, yeah jarring and uh, the state ended up buying 500 acres of old sugarcane field just um, north of highway 90 uh, north of of Homa um, <clears throat> And, you know, sugarcane land uh, is not the best land, even though it's 30 miles inland and a little bit higher land, it's still between two impaired water bodies and going 30, uh, 30 miles inland maybe isn't the solution all the time. Um, and then the, I had seen some of the construction plans and I don't know where they're at now, but it, I had questions around what happens when someone gets a hundred and fifty thousand dollar kind of town home that is not really their normal kind of place that they would live in and then what are the insurance and the liabilities moving forward and you know a lot of questions around land use and who owns the land and what have you but the last i heard is that there the there was talk and i don't know how much truth there is but that that project is continuing to move forward and those who are buying in um, you know, to the plan uh, do, and then they, you know, but there's still, there is no construction that's happened there yet. Right now, some folks are in kind of transitionary homes, 
um, but that there is some sort of kind of strange trade-off um, where you have like access to your land for a certain amount of time, but it, the next generation doesn't inherit it. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit, that's about all I can offer. And I heard, mm -hmm. this is, I don't know, you know, that uh, OCD <laughs> was going to be um, handing the project off to Terrebonne Parish government, but I don't know where that sits at this point. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I have I have three more questions here. Um, this is from Katie. Um, hi, I'm sorry if this is a bit general, but what do you think are the best steps forward for environmental departments such as the Louisiana DEQ to rectify and prevent future damage? Big question, <laughs> but yeah. And, you know, I, uh, I drive through Chalmette on the regular and uh, Chalmette has some of the worst air quality in the nation because of sulfur dioxide emissions that are coming from the rain CII, which is like a Coke facility. Um, and they keep saying that they're going to put up monitors. Maybe they did put up monitors. I don't know. I mean, but do they monitor the monitors once they put up the monitors and how those numbers get changed and how, you know, refineries are monitoring themselves? You know, there's just all of these. It's like, uh, let's just stop the pollution. Um, this, let's just know that you know, this is poison, we put it into the air and we're putting it into the water on the regular too. And I think that, you know, in regards to water quality, y'all, I was, you know, 30 years old before I was like, oh, when I turn the water on, that's coming from the Mississippi River, <laughs> you know? And I don't know where I thought it was coming from before, but it was like shocking and disgusting. And then I was like, oh my God, my grandmother is brilliant because she's always had a cistern and she's always been at, she's like, she, until she was 90 years old, she was still, would only wash her hair with rainwater because she didn't want that water coming out the tap. And when I went to the water treatment facility in St. Bernard Parish about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was horrified then when the guy was like oh yeah because there's the you know it was exxon mobil it was standard oil it was you know refinery that's there in chalmette and they're like we have a really good relationship with refinery whenever they have an accident they call us and we turn the water intake off and it was like yeah but they pushing stuff out of there all the time even when they're not having an accident you know it was just like this whole rationale um and when I was looking at some of the numbers today, um, I think that it was in 2019, $5.5 billion went back to the U.S. Treasury from offshore oil and gas leasing. And some of you may know this. There's many people on the call who are deep, deeper, deeper in it than me. But um, so there's the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, um, which takes a percentage of the royalties that are created from offshore deep water oil and gas, and then distributes that back to the Gulf states. And so the state of Louisiana, you know, we have this master plan, which is really bad language, um, but there is a coastal plan, um, which, um, you know, is you know, has all of these projects and every couple of years, four or five years, they come out with a new plan and a revised plan. And it seems like every time they come up with a new plan, it's like um, the worst case scenario from the four years before ends up being the best case scenario for the present. And that's because, you know, the scientists just weren't predicting sea level rise to happen the way that it is and all of these things. So, you know, I, I, um, you know, is it DQ? Is it the EPA? Is it the people demanding that we cannot, like, this is, you know, genocide in another kind of way that's happening in a slow, violent, you know, kind of invisibilized way all the time? Um, and I get really frustrated in, like, um, yeah, I knowing that policy is so important, but also that, that until we people start to demand better and start to connect the dots and be like, oh yeah, okay, well this is, um, and really start to have that like more cultural shift. I feel like the agencies, um, they'll only do what they have to do and they're serving whoever they 
they so choose, you know, and it's not necessarily the people like they're supposed to. So I'm sorry. I don't think I, that was an answer, but. I mean, I think, I think you, in a, in a way, it does point to the overarching fact that um, these agencies and the policies they follow are 100% established by Louisiana lawmakers, your local elected re representatives, as long as they continue to parlay into laws and choices that do things like allow these companies to self-report and self-monitor their emissions. This is unfortunately the results we're going to get from our bureaucratic and government agencies because the people who set the laws and the policies that these agencies end up following or building their structures around are your literal elected lawmakers. If they don't feel any urgency or um, if we're unable as people to convince them of the urgency or make sure that they are voted out for their lack of interest in the subject, uh, these policies will continue to be sort of tepid, wishy-washy and obscure as you've described. I think it's important to know that the only election that matters is not the president, although that does matter. It's it's literally like your your interior, like Louisiana state representatives. Um, yeah, like to speak to that. Actually, um, uh, one of the I was going to ask you. I remembered my question, but I want to ask Jerome's question first. Jerome asks Monique, where in Saint uh, Bernard Parish are your ancestors located? Um, the, it's funny, there was like a small band of Homa that all made the migration together and then they all kind of bought land together, um, next to each other, um, specifically on land that was the former Kenilworth, Kenilworth plantation land, but it's right near the, um, right near the old St. Bernard Catholic Church and Cemetery on the high ridge where, most of the Isleños who were moved to St. Bernard Parish were given land grants there in the 1700s. So the old, the old part, St. Bernard, St. Bernard, as they say, people are like, what? You know, you from St. Bernard, you're from Chalmette. I'm like, I'm not from Chalmette, from St. Bernard, St. Bernard. <laughs> the original St. Bernard. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um. Yeah, Katie says that that definitely helped and answered the question, helped her understand like what's most important going forward. Um, let's see here. Uh, and um, uh, my question was, um, are you aware of like the LNG plant in Cameron Parish or like the multiple plants that they're attempting and how there was recently a hearing on it? Yeah, um, I wanted to add some of that data today, but then I like got so overwhelmed um, in thinking about it because it is a little horrifying and the whole LNG expansion, there are five terminals that are currently being planned, I want to say. Um, and there's the one in Sabine Pass, which I, I passed last year, and that was super horrifying to see. Um, just how huge that facility is um, and also how it felt like something that could be put on the moon like it's like outer spacey feel you know where it's like oh they don't need people to be here all the time and it can go underwater and that's where all of these terminals are in super like coastal her in hurricane alley zones Excuse me, and um, and this double downing on LNG, especially in this moment, um, where um, where the um, sorry, I'm like looking in the chat. Thanks, thanks, Robert, for for sharing that. Um, yeah, no, and then this offshore LNG facility that they're wanting to put down and like off the coast of Plaquemines. I don't know. All of it just seems like so kind of future, <laughs> future bad planning. Um, and uh, most of those corp companies are Chinese owned too. And all those exports are for international. They're not for us. And right now with the war going on and the whole in Ukraine and um, how the European Union is in need for, you know, for, it's just like, whoa, when, are, wait, hold on. I thought we were like, you know, but it's kind of one of those things that I fear, which is that we're piped and tapped and 
the oil used to flow one direction. Um, crude was flowing north and now gas is flowing south and it always comes down just like, you know, why Standard Oil had their first refiner, you know, this huge, one of their biggest refineries here or in north of here in Baton Rouge. Um, it's all about access and access to, to water and transport and where plantations once sat, petrochemical plants now sit. And it's all tied to this like capitalistic short-sightedness that um, continues to violate human rights. And we, we can't, you know, we can't just keep going along with it, even though it's out of sight, out of mind in the case of these terminals. Um, it's still, you know, the impacts are felt in people's backyards across the country, really, at this point, because we're connected by waterways and pipelines. Um. Yeah, I, want to, I wanted to uh, drop um, uh, General Russell Honoré's uh, Facebook in here because he has several links to the upcoming or to uh, news about the LNG project and upcoming hearings for that. LNG project and I've just dropped that in the chat and then I also want to drop a link um, from I believe the advocate that um, well oh shoot now it's for subscribers only hopefully y'all can maybe get a free uh, one free click and get down there but there is a Louisiana DEQ did open the comment period for this they extended it until April 12th which is in three days um, let me see if I can find a better link, but in the meantime, it is in that article. Um, so I have that dropped in chat. And then, um, Jim Morales has a couple questions. Um, oh, I, I recently found out I am 50% Native American on my mom's side, uh, from your neighbors in South America. That side is disconnected through generations of colonization, assimilation, and relocations. Do you have any advice on trying to reconnect? Second question, how can someone get more involved with the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network? Um, <laughs> I, I really, I don't think I have an answer. I'm so sorry. I think that, um, you know, for me, uh, one, one reconnection that I maybe didn't, um, recognize <laughs> until I got a little older um, but just that you know being in Ponisha even though I didn't grow up there I feel so comfortable there in a way that like I have remembered like my DNA is actually of that place um, that it's a uh, the you know i know it it's in my bones like literally in my bones so i think going to the place um and knowing that you know you're tied to it even though maybe you've never been there before um so that's kind of just one recognition rec recommendation um and uh yeah, Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. Uh, Weekend does a ton of public programming and um, has amazing resources and is supporting amazing projects all over the world. Um, and <clears throat> we're, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're, you know, so grateful for Weekend support to help really, um, uh, you know, get the get the Oklahoma Ikishholo. Um, some support and uh adding some momentum that was already growing but over the last year and a half it's been really um sweet to see how people have been able to do the work that they're feeling really called to do around land and water but you can follow them online too they have great um social media and lots of resources great Great. Um, and then Jerome says, growing up in Chalmette, I'm very familiar with the air we always breathed. It was quite a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I want to say thank you to everybody for your questions. Um, and uh, uh, Missa says, thanks very much for sharing all of this and for the ways to be in relationship document as a practical follow-up, which ways to be in relationship 
document is what I'll be posting on the city archives website on Monday. I will send a link to every registrant for that um, again. And, and also the link that Monique dropped in chat earlier. Um, I, I for, for folks with a genealogy questions in terms of Homa ancestry, there was a sort of guideline uh, where the tribal council in 1991 determined some criteria. It sounds like the tribal council has established a list of known ancestors that you would want to try to trace your family back to. Um, I've dropped a link to that. And um, let's see here. Uh, again, uh, my Louisiana love will be on WYES and PBS again um, on April 14th. Um, the Louisiana DEQ will be um, open for comment on the LNG project in Cameron until April 12th. Let me get you all, before we go, um, let me get you all a link to the WYES site for it. I believe you can join for $5 a month um, to watch it online. Just one moment. And um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Monique, before um, we, we end today? Yeah, no, just um, thanks for spending part of your Saturday. And um, please check out Return to Yakni Shido. Uh, there's many stories in, in that book. Um, and yeah, I, I think that these conversations are really important. And finding ways to protect what we love is and each other is so important during these really, I mean, the times are weird and wild. And I think... Um, yeah, it's important for us to uh, to stay connected because community um, always gives us strength. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, everybody, um, thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Monique, for everything. It's it's an introduction to all the issues, but it's a good and expansive one. Um, there's so much more research that I hope that everybody can um can uh you know um continue to research on their own time using some of the things that monique's discussed here today and some of the links that we've been dropping in chat um just just for y'all uh, in case you want to revisit this conversation um i will be posting this on on uh the city archives youtube channel uh, next week i'll be sure to email all registrants that link as well as soon as it goes up um Robert does have one question is, would you be willing to make a similar presentation on Zoom to Jano ICC? And um, I, I'd be happy to share Robert's email with you, Monique, after this, if you'd like me to. I, I followed up in a direct message. Oh, great. So. Thank okay. So. <laughs> okay, thank you, Amelia. Amelia says, thank you for an informative conversation and thank, thank you all for coming. <laughs>